a lot of discussion with you guys that are here. Um, we will, with the teachers that are here as well, you may want to ask them questions as well. They may have things that they want to say. Um, I'll be honest and open with you and, and up front before I even start. Um, I am in favor of moving to a 4x4 block. I know some people are not. Um, but I just want to get that out there in front of you before we even start so you know what, what my opinion is. Um, Couple things. You, as you came in, you got a handout that shows you what the new graduation requirements will be for starting next year. Okay. That will impact students in the amount of electives they can possibly take. Um, it may impact them in the types of classes they take throughout the graduate The reason we are looking at a possible schedule change is a couple reasons. It doesn't have anything to do with the achievement of the students in their classes. Okay, I will give you some information later. Um, just com uh, comparing us to Grand Bay High School, which is a similar high school to us in care. We're looking at this because uh, the graduation requirements are going up for students. We're looking at this because right now we have what I consider to be a pretty good, uh, robust, and well-rounded program with a number of electives that students can take. My concern from that end is that um, the number of graduation credits that increase um, affects the number of elective students take, which in turn could affect the number of electives that we're possibly able to offer. And thirdly, um, besides the graduation credits and the um, uh, elective piece, we have students who do struggle in high school. Doing nothing with our schedule dooms some students to not be able to graduate from the start. Uh, because they can't make up the classes that they may need to make up for graduates. So those are the three reasons that we're looking to possibly change. Um, I will also say that students who are high achievers, um, who are going to four-year colleges, who don't have trouble in school, even students who are going to two-year colleges, who are still high achievers and want to go to two-year college, um, their paths are a little different no matter what schedule we have. Generally speaking, no matter what schedule we're in, those students will be able to get the credits that they need. Um, in a block, because of the way it's set up, they will be able to take more electives if they so chose. The um, struggling students is where I'll show you that, um, again, I'll give you some statistics whenever we're talking about that. The struggling students can find themselves in a hole and find it, and find it hard to dig out of that particular hole. I want to talk to you first about the graduation requirements. I gave you a sheet. Um, what the big change that you're going to see on here, uh, social science credits, uh, that really hasn't changed a whole lot. English credits have not. Math credits have changed. Lab science credits have changed. And the fact that the students, all students, need to take world language credits has changed. Okay? Not every student that comes through here has to take world language for graduation credit starting next year, they will have to. Okay? That adds into the um, less flexibility within the state. Okay? As you look at that sheet, are there any questions that you have on those graduation requirements before I move on? Yeah. This uh, this requirements will not affect the current students right now, right? Would not what? The current ones. No. This these new graduation requirements start for the freshman class coming in next school year. That's why we're looking at this possible schedule change right now. Okay. Um, or something that we may do next year, or depending on how the teachers vote, um, what we may do moving forward. Okay, so again, it does not affect anybody who's in here right now, but it will affect freshmen that come in next year. Yeah. How many additional classes So you're talking about an extra um, lab science, talking about uh, two extra world language courses and you're talking about um, extra math credits as well. Ten credits is it, is it is, yeah, ten credits is a year-long course. <laughs> Five credits is a half year. But this is the schedule that kids can already take care of you. Some kids already do this in current configuration of the schedule as it is. These are the new graduation requirements, so there are a lot of kids who achieve good new requirements already as the way the schedule is currently designed. 
Um, yes, they do that with zero periods, and some students do take um, uh, independent study PD. That is how some students are able to take some extra courses. My, yes, that is true. My daughter graduated last year, and this is exactly what she did. And she took summer school once and had no zero period, no second period. And this is what she did. And she was, she went to El Camino, but she uh, graduated last year and was still involved in choir and drama and in all her own dance studio and all the stage productions for the whole year without any problems. My concern with having a whole year's worth of academics in the same semester, we were talking about electives, how is, how is that going to impact the performing arts program here? Because that's why we're here. We're sure. here for the band program. Sure. Um, and again, <coughs> Uh, we'll go over, I'll show you some sample schedules of what it would look like so that you can, you know, might have questions on those, but I will, I'll definitely go over that as well. You got a question on here? Um, so Yes. 
So I don't want. I, I also want to make sure that you understand that right now we do have a block schedules throughout the year as well. So where some people like to have that time, other teachers don't like to have that time. There is professional development that we would uh, work with the teachers on and make a change if that were something that happens. One more question. How do you deal with basic classes? Students are studying. So those are excellent questions, and what I, what, I'm, what I want to do is I want to give you the information tonight as far as what schedule you look like. Those types of questions are what I'm going to answer the next time. There are ways to do that, yes, I certainly will go over ways that that could happen. Um, let me take a few more questions. Hold on, hold on. Let me take a few more questions, and then I'm going to show you some scheduling scenarios so you see that. Okay. So, go ahead with your question. So my question is, the class of 2023 are eighth graders right now. Correct. And a lot of them go to art. I've heard about this from somebody who has a high school here, but I have eighth grade. How many people are here from middle school? So, since it really, especially the HPG affects this class of 2023, shouldn't that be communicated to middle schools that you're having these meetings? And can the future agency be communicated to the parents and artists? We, we, yes, we, we advertise this on our, on our uh, web page. We send it out via email and phone message to parents. But uh, not to the parents. We, we certainly can make sure that those folks are uh, included in that. Absolutely. Please do. Exactly not that. Okay. Um, yes, right here. Then I'm going to go up with Mr. Blentich, and then I'm going to show you some scenarios. Um, I 
would say that it was better for them to do that over the year versus doing it to have the same course of material in that same time frame. It gives them the chance to struggle and to make it up. Um, whenever we get to the when we get to the schedules, I'll show you what problems are there in flexibility of the type of schedule we have right now. What we have right now is fewer periods than what the students can be able to have. <coughs> Mr. Leffert, I know you had your hand. Uh, one is a request of you and the other sure. is a question. If you could just please, from the front, uh, rephrase or restate some of the questions. It's hard to okay. hear some of them up front. Absolutely. And my question has to do with the timing. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think that perhaps this is not the time to make the decision? And, and I say that from the standpoint of, one, we're in the middle of a WASP review cycle with the team coming back in March with certain things that we need to address this year. Two, even though these new criteria, these new guidelines are coming down the pipeline, a lot of this is based on conjecture about the struggling student. So my question is, what harm would there be in waiting a year for any possible implementation, see how the incoming freshman, the class of 2023, is doing with this schedule, revisit it instead of January of 19, revisit it in January of 2020, when we actually have some live data, even for one semester, and then we can look at how are they doing under the new English or math or science or world language requirements in such a way that we could still make adjustments. So, don't you think it might be prudent to wait a year when we have some real life data in our hands? So, I'll answer your question this way. You're coming from a teacher's perspective. Sure. Okay. And, and I certainly respect that. I've heard many teachers ask that question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say that most likely, whenever teachers vote on this, that would be one of the options that they could choose to say, let's wait, let's look and see how it affects the students, and make a decision to follow it. Only caution I have on, on that is, generally speaking, freshman schedules are very prescriptive for um, what, whatever schedule you're in block or the traditional that we have right now. Um, you may have to wait two years to see any effect on how this is, um, what toll this is having on elective programs. Um, once you get down that road, it um, could be problematic not saying it would be, but it could be problematic if people are, if that second year, people aren't choosing electives and teachers may have to be um, surplus to other schools. Again, it's problematic. I'm not saying that's not something that could happen, that, that couldn't happen. That again is up to the teachers when they vote. I want to, you know, I, if parents have that type of thought too, that's going to come through. And that will be information that I give to, uh, to you guys as teachers as well. But that certainly could be an option that teachers look at. Yes, Laura. So, yeah, my thought along those lines was this is a huge change for the district. The district is imposing this on the school. I realize the school has no choice about whether to comply with this. Is that correct? school does. No, we do. So no, we do. We don't do it. No, no, no. No, no, no. The graduation, the graduation, requirements. graduation requirements are district wide. Right, but the graduation requirements are something that we always have. Yes, I do, we do not have uh, same graduation requirements. That it is, is a big change, and I think my concern when I look at this is this is a big change on its own. Mm -hmm. The change to block four by four is a big change. If you make two huge changes at once and things don't work well, it's hard to know what to assign credit or blame to in terms of changes. And so, yeah.
So um, just a piece of uh, data for you is I we looked at, and this is one of the things that Mr. Blunt has been asking to do um, in our first staff meeting, everyone will come up and I'm going to report out to the staff on it. I took a look at every freshman level course and every sophomore level course to see what the failure rate is. Okay. Across the board in those classes that students are required to take, anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of the students are struggling, and when I say struggling, the F is the 20 to 25 percent of students. Okay. So one out of every five students is what we consider struggling um, with what they're doing. But that goes along with the high absentee rate, which I don't know what that is. <coughs> this is far worse because you miss a couple of days, maybe in the honeymoon. And now the struggling student has to cope with the I um, understand the thought process there. I'm on a different side of the fence with that one. Um, uh, to me, you have less classes that you're dealing with at one time, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have more work to make up. You might have more for one class that you're making up, but there are less classes that you're dealing with. So the amount of work to me is similar in that case, but I, I get where you're coming from. I understand the point. Yeah. Well, that kind of brings up another issue for me. Uh, my son is an introvert and he misses out on a lot of um, class participation points. And uh, I can't, he already misses so many points in the current schedule. I can't imagine him being in a class for my units, how many points he's going to lose out, or if he's sick for a day. If it, like, it's not possible to make that. It's not like he can do extra work at home. And then, and then the workload, like, to me it sounds like college. You're, you're putting an entire year's worth of academics into one semester. My son struggles in math. I don't see him spending more time in that classroom helping him at all. And in one case, if he's getting concepts slower than some other kids, by the time he's caught up, the class is over. So that that's another concern of mine. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go here and here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some schedule scenarios. Right. Okay, Mr. Murray, I'll, I will let you do as well. And I want to see you some scheduling scenarios. And I promise you folks, whatever comments, questions, things you have, I'm going to stay here as long as it takes this evening. Um, I want, I still want people to send me things because the next time we're going to go over some questions as well. But I want to be able to show you some scenarios and, and information. So Start your chair. Thank you, Mr. I know you're, you want to show us this additional One, I, I think it is appropriate to conversation to focus on struggling students, although I'm hearing some appropriate skepticism as to whether this schedule will help them achieve. Our number one objective is to help students meet these, this criteria, and so that needs to be number one. However, uh, as parents of two students who have come to Rio specifically because of their role in how matching or in that music program, I think it's important that as we look critically at whether this helps struggling students, we also consider what has made Rio such an excellent school. And I believe that it's music program is one of those things that I absolutely agree with really that. Yep. And so going back to a similar question, I'm just wondering if you have any um, data or analysis as to whether or not other schools that have music programs as, as uh, advanced as Rio's and at that same level of achievement have successfully implemented this kind of lock program and have that same level of achievement in this program. So um, our program is a very unique high school program. Um, there are not many like it across the country. Uh, can I, I can't stand here and say that I have data that says either programs like ours have been successful or not successful um, in a block schedule. What I can tell you is I know I talked with Mr. Murray the other day. Um, his concern was about making sure that band classes still remain a year in length. I'll show you a few schedules this evening that would have band students having a schedule with their band classes a year in length, a full year in length, and still being able to meet the rest of their graduation requirements. I'll show you that as one of the things this evening. But I don't have the data on the specific question of whether, whether um, programs well, I can only speak from my experience on that. I had a very successful band program at the school I was at back east. Um, 
was one of the top 100 band programs in the country. However, it's not the same type of program as Murray had. Lock schedule did just fine. Continued the excellence that they always had. But again, it's a different type of program. Uh, this is fun. Um, my, my understanding, I'm going to be, I'm going to be I was even further, if you have any information to share, that'd be great. But my understanding is that programs such as ours, when this sort of uh, schedule is implemented, is basically the end of that program. And so I think we need to look at that very, very carefully. Sure. We'll go right here. So the current, the only credit changes is that you're changing math from two years to three years, you're changing science from two years to three years, and you're increasing your language. Two years of life. Yeah, two. But most people already take like four years of math and complete. That's not really like a large change. Most people already take two or three years of language. That's not the main change is science, which some people take two years and some people take three years. So I, I feel like the change, adding over your high school period, adding eight years, eight, not eight years, eight more classes is a lot, an unnecessary amount to compensate for one extra class of science. And some people would argue that it would increase the grades, but I would say that's like eight so why, why, what, what are like the main questions to do this while we're also changing our So I would say again, struggling students, the students who struggle and are unsuccessful would not have the time necessary to make up the courses that they might not do well in to be able to graduate. And we need to find a way to work with those struggling students. That's one. The other is with the new graduation requirements that are put in place, our elective programs as we have them now, would change in some way. I see less elective programs now. How many less? I can't tell you that. Uh, but I do see that we may have less art classes that we offer. CTE programs that we've started may go away. The ability to take um, students who take AP classes that are not required, those may go away. Things like that could happen to what we're able to offer. I can't predict exactly what, because that is all determined on what students want to take. So those are the two main reasons right there why we're looking at this. Mr. Murray, I'll let you, I know you want to say something, so. Sure, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stand. Uh, so Mr. Gaper's in, in a tough situation here. Um, and um, so first of all, all the parents, I think, thanks for being here. Um, it, I do want you to, to recognize as you go through this that everybody has you know, good intentions and good will. So, and, and everyone's trying to do what's best for the school. So, so just please think about that. Um, I, we may disagree on you know, how that should be done, but you know, it's all going to be in the right place. Uh, what, I've been giving this a lot of thought, and um, sort of what I've come up with lately is that the district is giving us an unfunded mandate. That's what's happening. Uh, they're, they're telling us we have to do this and giving us no funds to implement. If the, the amount of money uh, that was needed was behind it, this would not be a problem. We could expand zero period classes, possibly offer seven period classes, we, could, we would have more sections of classes to offer kids, and this would not be an issue. So what I'm thinking is that the district needs to put its money for its office. And if they're going to require us to do this, which is not, these are not bad requirements. It's theoretically good for kids to, to learn more about the world. Um, but they, they should be giving the schools more sections, more teachers, that will allow us to do all these things with the current schedule that we have without any problem. So I feel like what we should be doing is very strongly lobbying the district, whether it's superintendent, whether it's the uh, director of high schools, or whether it's the board, lobbying them to pay for this. There are reserves. This district has reserves. They have money. In fact, we're in very good shape right now, financially, the district is. They can spend it on this kind of thing if they believe it. So, that's, that's where I am. Is the okay. mandate, mandate the increasing requirements? Yeah. It's not a mandate saying you have to do a full No, correct. Right. Right. 
But, but your point, Mr. Murray, is that we, those resources would bring more teachers and help us. Yeah, this is going to be a problem at every single high school. Community. Yeah, so this, the, I will tell you that the schools in the district that are not block schools right now, um, that uh, are looking at the graduation requirements, are all having a discussion of whether they are going to switch to a block school or not. Oh. We're not the only school. Well, Benito's not. Bella Vista is, I'm sorry, Benito's not. Bella Vista is, El Camino will be. Uh, Marilyn was not. I talked to somebody there, and uh, they actually, because of the spring testing in their IB program, they said, oh, we won't change. Okay. So, there. Well, I do, I do know three of the four that aren't, have, are, are talking about it. Maybe not as far along as we are. I know Bella this has just started talking about it. Um, El Camino's principal has talked to me about it a little bit. Don't know where he's at with the staff on that. Uh, let me, I want to show you some, just some scheduling things. Okay, so what I want to show you here is, is kind of a, this is a student, this top one, is a student who was four year college bound and the new graduation requirements are in place, okay? When you add that column up here, you get 220 credits. Right now, this column is a four-year college student who's doing well, not necessarily struggling. And these are the old graduation requirements. Big difference that you see here, 70 credits of choice electives that students have. Here, 30 credits of choice electives that they have. That in itself will mean less students taking elective classes, which could mean different courses would have to be long. That in itself is 40 credits per student. Okay? Now remember, the choices we are talking about, band is a choice. AP classes are not required for choice. Elective, while some of them are required for certain areas of A through G, others if you go if we go further than some of the cursory level classes are choice. Those are the programs. The um, CTE programs that we have that are three year required for completers. Those are the programs we're talking about that will be affected. Yes, it's under the current schedule. This is this right here is new graduation requirements. Current schedule. Current schedule. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So this is the new. It looks like there's one year of no choice. Okay. There's 30 elected. Right. But, and let me explain that a little bit. These numbers can get confused. This is a student, as I said, four-year college bound, no issues with struggling, passes all their classes. Okay? So as you look across their freshman year, all the classes that they would be taking as a freshman um, gives them 60 credits. That's how many credits a student takes taking the full schedule. Unless they have a zero-period class, then they can have 70 credits. 9 was other than English. So, Spanish or French for us. Aren't they required? If they're going to four-year colleges, they're not required Yes. Yeah, and that's why I have up here that a student who's going to a four-year school is taking that. This column is, of course, is a... Zero over there. You have a zero over there, and they, they have to they take have that. They have to take that. If you're a four-year bound okay. four-year college and your existing graduation requirements, you're taking two years of language. No, what I'm saying is that graduation requirements are this, not four-year college. This is a four-year college yeah, student. You're saying four-year college bound. Right, right. You're four-year college bound, but you're taking your, your electives and you're putting them in foreign language. Now. Right, they're taking, they're taking those courses there, yes. Right, and you don't have any statistics to say of the people, of the 70 credit electives, how many people are, because they're bound for four-year college, are already taking math and foreign language. You have new requirements coming up and you're saying, oh, these new requirements are making it so difficult for everybody. I'm okay. not saying they're making it difficult for everybody. But it's struggling saying, students. I've said from the beginning, four-year college students that are going through these requirements, they will get their credits. They will make it. It will not be a problem for them. No matter what schedule they're in, they will make it. 
they will get the credits they need. What I'm saying is when I get down to below here, you see struggling students and how it affects them. That's my, that is where one of the big reasons why I am looking at this and why we're looking at this as a school, because of the struggling students. These students, it's not going to affect in a negative way if we stay where we're at. But the effect of, uh, it's not very accurate. Correct, because four-year college students yes. take those courses. But they would have done that up today, anyway. Right, and I'm not, I'm not, yes, I will give you a second ago. I'm not saying that, that those students, again, from the beginning, I am not saying that a student who is four-year college bound is going to have an issue. They are not. They will be able to get their credits in the schedule that we have. And so I'm just trying to, okay, trying the struggling to student is the issue. But you have the electives going from 70 to 30 and Correct. just lost on day to day. That's choice. So the 70 electives means a choice, okay? So whether a student's going to college, two-year college, or they're not going to college, that is a choice they are making. 